Isomorphic JavaScript. Okay, how did I come across isomorphic JavaScript? Um, I, just a little history of me. I w used to work for a place called Object Partners, which is one of our sponsors, and we do a lot of training. And uh, I had to create a React class. And w as I was creating the React class, everybody kept coming up to me, hey, I've been hearing that you can r render React on the server. Are you going to do that? And I went, no, because I didn't, I didn't know. So I had, with enough people asking me, I went ahead and tried to figure it out. And so I'm going to tell you about my adventure. Um, disclaimer. I do not have anything in production in React right now. Uh, I'm, so this is a lot of uh, stuff, and so I, this is all pretty much demoware for you. But it's pretty cool. I, I, I really enjoy it. So here we go. Right. So the first thing I ran across is we're, what we're going to call it. And uh, Michael Jackson, who is pretty active in the React community, says proposed on Facebook's. Uh, GitHub, right? Facebook gets to decide what we name things, apparently. Um, said, hey, let's change things from isomorphic to universal because of definitions and because of what. And our buddy Blaine Kasten, where are you, Blaine? <laughs> All right. He's, he's, he speaks up and says, hey, come on. We've been calling it isomorphic for like a century or at least two months. So, um, right? And then Ryan came back and said, well, we're out teaching it and people understand universal more than, Java, than isomorphic. So we're going to go ahead and change it to universal and make everybody happy, all right? Is that, is that cool with you, all right? I know, right? So I'm going to hurry up and get this talk done before they change it again on me. All right. So one of the great things about it as I was ex exploring it, okay, so now we know that we want JavaScript to run on the client and on the server, right? <laughs> and so we want to use that same JavaScript to be able to run on the client and the server. So I'm like, great. And then we can actually mix it in with our APIs. And we're going to have one project that's going to feel kind of like a fat client, but not really, because it's going to be on there. And I'm like, I totally figured this out. I am totally not missing the point of server-side render JavaScript. And then the guy from Ember says, hey, you're missing the point of server-side render JavaScript, right? So there, actually, Ember is creating a um, what's called fast boot. They're, they're creating something that works, and so does React, that actually renders on, on the server side. And what, the, what he says, and this is really what, what, what the point is, is we're not really trying to take the JavaScript and replace our API and really combine everything with it. We're actually just trying to pre-initialize the client so that we don't have to make so many server calls once the, our, our first visitor hits the page for the first time. We can just actually send the view as it's supposed to be right across the wire and have it render immediately. Cool? So Zach wants to know if he wants to drink the universal Kool-Aid. See how I, that's my mad Photoshop skills there in the EGNS code, right? So is there something that's going to make it as easy as CSS? Because CSS is apparently very easy to Zach. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you that, uh, yeah, it's uh, React and uh, Ember now, and Ang even the Angular guys are talking about uh, trying to come up with a way to render things server-side. Everybody's figuring out that this is actually going to be pretty cool, especially for your mobile web. Um, anybody use React at all? Heard of React? Yeah, you guys. All right. Um, this is really all I'm going to say about it. It's a, it's a library for building user interfaces. It's created by the Facebook people. Um, you get to build simple components and combine them, just like what Mike was talking about. It's a library for that, M Mr. McCauley. Where are you at, Mike? There you are. Right? And you get to use JSX, which is like their own version of HTML that cross compiles into JavaScript. And um, what's really cool is the library can actually be rendered on the server. And we'll talk more about that. And it really looks a little bit like this. Right? You just have a you use the React Create class uh, factory. You have some configurations, and it has a render method that spits out a piece of DOM that you manipulate. And that's, right? And so then Nick tells me, hey, congratulations, you made a view, right? So there's a lot more in our application than just the view, right? And you should actually see Nick's Vim RC file on GitHub. It's pretty cool. So then he came back and said, hey, we've got Flux. Not only, right, because React only really covers the view part. And we've got Flux to help you with your data flow and it, to be able to get things to your component. Uh, uni 
Flux follows a unidirectional data flow, and it really has four main parts. Where the stores is where all of your business logic kind of lives. Actions or action creators, which is your events, right? It's kind of an event-driven framework. Uh, the dispatcher, which takes the events and broadcasts them to the stores. And then your components, your React components. And once again, it's, it's an event-based uh, structure that they name Flux, right? So if you go out on the web and you look for Flux, this is what you get. Uh, you get this little, little uh, diagram where you're, you fire off an action, it goes to the dispatcher, the store registers for these events on the dispatcher, the dispatcher tells the store, and then the store tells the view. The view registers for changes on the store, and then it populates itself. And then if something happens in the view, again, it fires another action, goes to the dispatcher, which tells the store, which tells the view, right, vice versa. For me, it's easier to see it if I actually kind of look at an application and like put it into different components. So this is really what's happening. So the blue line is your application, right? The, that's the entire square. Within the little green part would be your, com your main component. They call them controller components. And that's the component that registers for changes on your store. And then within that component, we have a table component and the table has row components. We've all built, uh, I don't know, I, I mean, I have thousands of these applications probably with everybody in the room that has something that feels sort of like this. The cool thing about it is if you click that delete button that's in the row right there, you're not actually talking to the store, you're not talking to your business logic. All it's doing is it's firing an event that goes to the dispatcher, right? Because that's what we looked at, fires the action to the dispatcher. So the table component and the row component can be completely separate and completely autonomous. They know nothing about the application or the data that it's displaying at this point, which I, I felt was pretty awesome. So now we can, we can get our data, we can render our view. How do we determine what place we are and what views we should actually be showing? And Ember has a routing component, Angular has a routing component. Uh, all of your, I think even Backbone has routing components or you have to write your own. There's a lot, everybody uses a routing component and now there's a project that's called React Router. And this is where it kind of gets interesting because um, the creator of uh, React Router, Brian Florence, um, had created this demo while during uh, React Conf that he, that he showed that where you can render the stuff on the server and just use a React router to manage if you're rendering on the server or um, in your client. And I saw his project and it says, work in progress, move along. So of course I'm gonna base everything upon something that's not done because it, I thought it was cool, right? So you have two entry points into your application. You have your server or your browser, right? So you have your application, it's living, and on the server, if you need to render it, you need an entry point into it. And that would be your index route handler, or whatever you use to serve up your index.html. In the browser, it's your app.js, bundle.js, whatever you call it, right? So you have to manage those two entry points. And the main challenge of that is that the browser application is completely asynchronous, right? We, we want to just fire off our, our application in the browser and let all of our components figure out the data, fire off the data, get the responses back, and populate themselves. We don't really want to manage the, what order they're going to be in, and we've, that's just the nature of, of our JavaScript application. But the server needs to behave like it is synchronous, right? Because we have to do all of this asynchronous stuff, get all the data from the database, prefetch uh, pre it, and then put it into our view so that that can all be rendered in our index.html and then sent across the wire to pre-initialize our client. Zach doesn't want it to be synchronous, okay, right? But, right, so there's a possibility that that's gonna be kind of a performance hit. But when you think about it, it's just a bunch of uh, asynchronous calls that we all have to resolve, right, before we do that. So the major difference, if you're gonna use it within the React Flux um, context, is that the browser components are gonna communicate just like that diagram I showed you. It's just gonna be with your actions, asynchronously with the stores, the stores are gonna populate it. So when your single page application is running, it's just running like normal, like you would think about it. But within the server components, you have to figure out a way to make it synchronous and actually have the, 
components talk to the stores directly so that we can get all of that data, figure it out, and then, and then populate it, right? So let's just talk, let's break this down to two different things. Let's just handle the server first, right? We're going to do server-side rendering. So on the server, we really want to do these five things. We want to render the route or the view, right? Where, where are we at? We want to figure out where are we at in the application, what are we going to render? We have to prefetch all of that data, then we have to create the HTML and store it as a string, as a variable in our application, and then we also have to store the data where it can be accessed by our client application once it's pre-rendered, right? Because we're, it's a stateless application. So we need to actually take that data that we've pre-rendered and set it up because if our client gets the index.html and we fire off our application, our React application, and it doesn't, it's not gonna know about that data that we've pre-rendered it, right? So it's gonna say, oh, well, the data is null right now, so I need to go back out and fetch it. And then what we've done is essentially just worked against ourselves, right? We've, we've taken away all of the advanta advantages of pre-initializing our view at that point. And then after we got all of that gathered, return the response, return the index.html. Right, so I just wanna to touch on, uh, for, for this project, I used Happy because I'd never used it before, and since I was doing a bunch of things that I've never done before, why not? I mean, most of my, all my JavaScript apps are in ex ex Express, and uh, Happy had been gaining a lot of, uh, a lot of popularity, a lot of things going on, and the people that build it are really smart, so I was like, hey, you know what, I'm gonna give it a shot. And really what it feels like is, a, is an express application that has all the configurations that I've written, I would have written anyway. So, it, I mean, it was, it was really smooth and, and really easy to use. So, let's just talk about that, server, that creating the HTML and saving it as a string part, the server-side render. So, what our server application needs to do is determine which of those components are actually active, right? We have to figure out what are we gonna actually show. And then, after we get that figured out, then we have to determine what's the data that we need in order to populate our components or our templates. Then we have to get that data, and then we can render the HTML. So, right, those are the four steps that we have to take. Ooh, I was gonna show some code, and I didn't really know what kind of code to show in, and so, uh, Nick says I should probably try to use Vim, but I'm not really that good, so I'm just gonna use Atom, right? So here's, this is what the happy index route would look like. If you can, can everybody see that top corner? Is that big enough? Yeah, it's, it looks basically, right, server.route, we're mapping the get method to everything that comes in, right? A everything and anything comes in, that's the way you do it with HTML5 routing, and then we're just gonna pass it off to the handler. And then our handler in here, all we're doing is calling the render app function, which we'll see in a little bit later, right? We're gonna pass it the request and a callback that expects to get back an error if there is an error, or the HTML and the data, right? Because we're gonna go out, prefetch all the data, create the HTML, and then we can actually reply. So the render app function looks something like this, and then, I mean, of course, I mean, it, with, when you write it, it's probably gonna look completely different, but the concepts will be the same. Um, the, just, uh, just so that we know, location and router here, and the routes functions, th those are all uh, imported into our, in, into our uh, class. And the location and router are, are from the React router classes. So here, we're just gonna say router, go ahead and run, on, with the routes configuration and the location that we figured out from the request by the path and the query that was passed in. And then once you've run, call this callback and give us the initial state of the router and whatever the transition is that's happening. Right? And just so that you know, the routes configuration looks something like this in the React router. It's, it's a nested object of paths with a string for matching Component, which would be an instance of the component if you import it in, so it knows what to new up, so to speak, with the factory. And then if you have any child routes that are nested within there, you have a child routes array that also have the object configurations. That's what it looks like. So, now that we've run the router, and we've got the initial state and the transition, the router is actually running, then all we have to do is Fit, prefetch our data. So we have the fetch function that's uh, 
that takes the initial state from the router. So what the, we'll, we'll look at this in a second, but the initial state has all of the components that would actually be active at this point. Um, the user that, that we've got, for, if you've got security going on, and the actual request. And you can see that it's just a, it's a promise that needs to be, res be resolved. And then we're going to just call back um, the callback that's passed from render app, which is going to render our view and send it back. Right? So the fetch function looks something like this. You're going to figure out if there's actually a router state. So if we're in a situation where um, the router doesn't have a state as of yet, and this has been called, we're just going to go ahead and, and exit out and just return an, an empty object so it doesn't blow up. Otherwise, we're going to pull out the params, the query, and the actual components that are in the, in the router state. So now it has a list of all of the components, your React components, that are available, or your Ember uh, components, or, or you know, whatever. You're just going to have all of those. And then we're just going to filter all of those and see if they have a, a method that you can call on fetch to pre-populate uh, pre the data. And then from there, we're going to actually just call those and return back an array of those promises, right? So then basically, if there's, you have three components and they all three need uh, separate pieces of data, those three uh, asynchronous requests go out, we're going to store them in a promise in an array, and then we're going to wait, right? So down below, if we're promised at all, we're going to wait for all of those fetchers to resolve, and then we're going to get that data array and then all we're going to do is take that data array and squash it down into a single object and return it. Right? So how do we do that in, in React? Right? Because we can't actually call anything on a, a React component instance unless if it's actually been populated or created. And if it's been created, then it's already too late to pre-initialize it with the data. Right? So uh, React has a, a notion of static blocks. Right? The statics object, it allows you to find uh, static methods that can be called on the component class, and they can actually be run before React, the React factory does its, does its work. So, and we get, we get that. Uh, so it's the static fa fetch method would just look something like this. You have your fetch, it's in your statics. We're going to, the, this component needs to make two uh, calls to a database, and all we're going to do is call both of the different stores, the timesheet store, the time unit store, the get and the list based upon that, and then just return that as a promise as well in our fetch. Right? So we've got promise, calling other promises, and calling other promises, and they're just resolving into one single array. So once that's all done, right? we're going to wait. Once all of those fetchers are, are done, we've smashed them all down, and we're going to return that object. So now we're back in that render app function that was in our index, uh, index uh, handler or route handler, and we're just going to call the callback. Now this is where it gets cool because taking all of this data and mashing it into a template and rendering out as a string so that you can use it, uh, that's a that's a pretty difficult chore, right? Because it actually has to know about the DOM. But what, what React has done is they have a a static function on the React object called render to string. And all you have to do is pass it in the, the main component, which is our router, right? And it just renders all of that HTML based upon all of those components, knowing all of that data that, it's, that they've pulled out um, into a string. And then we're going to go ahead and also send that data. So which, right? So then our index route gets that data and gets the HTML. And we're just going to reply with our index template uh, with our HTML and data. Right? So we have those both stored as strings or, and, and JSON, I mean, both of them. And we're re replying back. And I, I use Jade. And I just want to let you know that Nick loves Jade as much as he loves ketchup. And so this is what the, what the Jade would look like, right? Uh, we're just taking the HTML string, putting it inside our app div, and then taking our JavaScript, our, our JSON object, and putting it on window.appState. Putting it on window. Doesn't that feel great? 
So it looks something like this when it comes back, right? But the, the cool thing about this is with projects, you'll notice that there is no API call in the network tab right now. There's been no API call. It's just been pre-populated with data. And then the HTML down below, when we copy and paste it and put it into a uh, IDE, you guys can all read that, right? Isn't that awesome? It looks like this. Right? Yeah, we get it. <laughs> <laughs> right? So this is really the most important part. This is what the Java, the, your object's going to look like. So we're pre-initialized with, with projects. And so now it's on window. And it's been sent across. Oh, T-shirts. <laughs> Anyone? All right. T-shirts, T-shirts, T-shirts. OK. So now it's been rendered on the server, right? So now, in a browser, what's happening inside the browser? Because, like I mentioned, <laughs> like I mentioned, uh, if, if the React app it does, it notices that the data doesn't match, it's going to just start all over again. And then it's going to spit out to you and say, hey, you rendered this on the server, but it doesn't match. And so you just completely wasted all that work. So within the browser, we want to bootstrap the application normally. We want to determine which routes are active. We're going to use the seeded data instead now, instead of making the API calls. And then when the bootstrap is complete, we just let it run. Right? So in the browser entry, it looks just like normal. React, render, send in the router. It looks very similar to the render to string. And we tell it to get a hold, get a hold of the app and, and browse it. It's a cat in a sweater. It's not a turtle. So then we, we really initialize the hydrator, right? So for that, before anything starts up, we want to pull that stuff out of window, all right? And then we want to delete it out of window. So, and we're going to put it in our uh, app state, in our, in our rehydrator instance. So from there, we can just, in our stores, when we're pre-initializing the state of the stores, we just go and find to see if the rehydrator is going to give us any data. And if it's not, then we know that we're actually running the application. We're going to make our API calls. Um, and in, by initializing the state, we're going to go ahead and delete it out of there as well. Right? So the stores functions look like this a little bit. Right? So if, if it's been rehydrated, uh, make the call. Otherwise, use the rehydrated. Otherwise, we're just going to return the promise of null. Axios is a cool library. That's what I use for my HTTP calls. Just want to let everybody know. We get it. We get it. Vim is cool. And then look, he's like moving across the screen. OK. So that's, that's really it in a nutshell. Um, if you want to follow me, I'm on Twitter at Bruce Coddington. All of the code is going to be out there on GitHub on the, on the project if you want to see. And I'd love to have uh, comments, um, questions, anything on there. Um, also, I play in a band called Blue Moon Ghetto. We're on Spotify. The slides will be out on Slide Deck. There's the code to get to it. Check out these really cool links. And congrats, Zach. <laughs>